All right, thanks to those of you who are patiently waiting. We've got about two and a half minutes until we get this thing underway this week. So hang tight and then we will uh, we'll get it going. All right, that is the timer. Let's get this off the screen. Let's X out of the notification, go to the webcam. Looks like it's working. Uh, friends, enemies, hopefully more of the former than the latter. Welcome back to another weekly stock market scan, option selling analysis, uh, whatever you want to call it. We've got Petty Bourgeois in the chat, breaking the seal in the chat. What's going on? Good evening. And good evening to all of you who have joined us live. And those of you who are watching us after on YouTube, we love you all the same. Uh, but been a crazy couple weeks in the market. Uh, we did, did we stream last week? I don't remember if we did. Uh, but it feels like it's been a while. I think we've definitely got a lot to talk about. A lot has happened in the market. We've seen some kind of unprecedented moves upwards in the market lately uh, that we've, for the most part, been working against. Uh, thing We've had some, what I would call rough luck in the market, but the great news is that we've basically tread water for the last couple weeks. So let's talk about what we mean by that. Let's talk about our plan for next week. Uh, and you know the interesting stuff, right? How are we going to make more money from here going forward? Uh, so let's get into it. Let's go back to the normal presentation, put myself down in the bottom left, and uh, let's get started. So last week, little recap here, I got to zoom out a couple clicks. Uh, we lost $265 in the market, which is, you know, whatever, right? We, we are under the impression that we don't want to take big steps backwards. That's kind of the main goal with our strategy right now. We take a look at 2021 or 2022 for that matter. Uh, come on, come on, come on. We'll notice that especially early in the year, we had these big pullbacks, right? We'd make some good progress. We'd immediately give it right back. We'd make some good progress, have a couple, you know, flat-ish weeks. We'd immediately give it all back. And some of that, yes, is attributable to the fact that 2022 was a tougher market. Uh, but some of that is also attributable to the fact that we weren't scaling our positions properly. So the idea here is that when things move against us, instead of having like a full unit back down that we have to make back up, uh, you know, we have maybe half or a third of a unit down, we scale into full size and get that full unit back up when we get the move in our favor. So if we take a look, 
uh, at 2023 so far, we've kind of accomplished that, right? If we just focus on our account balance here, you know, we've had two weeks that have moved against us, the week of January 22nd and January 29th. Uh, what do I mean by these things moved against us? You might say, HT, the market's been ripping. What do you mean by this? Well, if you actually look at the positions that we've held for the last couple of weeks, it's predominantly bearish, right? If we go out to the right here, tons of bearish positions. We go out to the right for last week, tons of bearish positions. So really, we would have benefited if the market went down. Uh, so in a sense, for the last couple of weeks, 14 to 15 day period, uh, the market's been moving against us and it's been moving against us very, very heavily. And I just dragged this thing halfway off the screen on the stream. Hopefully that fixed it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if we take a look a couple weeks ago, 2.48% in the S&P 500, we know that that's a pretty big move upwards for a one week basis. Uh, similarly with NASDAQ, right? If 2.48% is larger on the S&P 500, almost double that uh, at 4.32% on NASDAQ is just enormous. And then last week, we had even more of that, a 1.64 increase in S&P 500 and a 3.31% increase in NASDAQ. So things are not just moving against us, but they're moving against us very, very steeply. Uh, but despite that, we have been able to kind of hang tight. We've scaled into positions. We've managed positions. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but we've scaled into what we want. We've kind of rolled with the punches and we've we've taken the first couple of blows from the market. Now, this is kind of a bend until you break strategy. So if things keep ripping upwards, you know, we'll probably take a little bit of damage. But that's just going to happen when things move against you so much. Typically, we're on the bullish side of things. So you know, the move against us, so to speak, is normally to the downside. But since we've scaled into bearish, you know, it's going to be the other side of things, which is a little bit more frustrating from a performance perspective, just because, you know, when you're playing something to go down and the market goes up, we compare ourselves to the overall market. So if the market's shooting up and we're going slightly the other way, uh, that's going to create a big outperformance gap. But the flip side of that is when the market goes down eventually, hopefully this week, who knows, we'll see. Uh, the great part is the market's going to be going down, our account's going up, and that's going to be a very, very big gap to bridge. So a little bit of perspective there. And I think the best way to visualize that is if you take a look at next week, we've got our base level profit kind of charted in here. Uh, but let's think about what would happen if the market did dip, right? If the S&P 500 went back to 400, which may be a little bit aggressive of a bearish estimate for next week. And then if NASDAQ went down about 3% as well, to like 11,650-ish, yeah, 2.97%, nailed it. Uh, what would that look like from an outperformance summary or perspective? And this is what it would look like. We would take the lead back against the S&P 500. Uh, we'd still be trailing NASDAQ by about 5%. But the other thing we want to remember as well uh, is that the NASDAQ move typically outpaces the S&P 500 move. So maybe something like 11,400 would be a more realistic pairing of results between the S&P 500 uh, and NASDAQ for next week. And if we look at what that looks like, you know, we're, we're kind of right in the thick of things. And the biggest, biggest, biggest takeaway that I want us to have from like where we are uh, compared to where the market is, is how we're doing right now. So if you take a look at where we are, right, we're at a 4.68% return and we've gotten that in about one month. Yes, the S&P 500 has returned 7.82% and let me actually back these out so it doesn't completely screw up our tracker. But yes, the S&P 500 has returned 7.82%. Yes, NASDAQ has returned 14.72%, which is absolutely insane, insane, insane. But that's not going to, you know, it's not going to stay that way forever, right? We know that the S&P 500 returns on average between 9 and 10% per year. So the path that it is on currently, uh, you know, it's not going to hold that. Can it keep going up? Can we finish with like a 20% year with no more red months? In theory, yes. But the you know steepness of this move up is inevitably going to decline a little bit. And that's the great part about our positions, right? Even if it does keep moving up a little bit, we've got all of these bearish positions, uh, which give us a little bit of a cushion just in case it does continue upwards. But the point that I want to make is it can be really frustrating when the market's moving up a bunch and you could have said, you know what, oh, I could have just put my money in the market, not touched a single thing, and I'd be doing better than we're doing right now. Uh, first point is long term. That's not the case. We're outperforming NASDAQ by about 130% and the S&P 500 by 113% uh, since we've started publicly tracking. Uh, and two, these aren't really sustainable. And th the gains that we have here are not attributable to the 
bull market, right? We're predominantly in bearish positions right now. We haven't made these gains because of the bullish market. In fact, over the last couple of weeks, we've made these gains in spite of that bullish market. So this is really, it's important to run our own race in a sense, meaning, yes, there's a little bit of a gap right now. Yes, we compare ourselves to the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, but we don't wanna get discouraged by underperformance right now. One, there's 11 more months in the year. And two, if we look individually at our performance, again, 4.68% return in the first month of the year. If we annualize that number, we go over to our website really quickly, hit tools, go to annualization calculator. Come on, come on, come on. And we start with January 1st and we go through the end of last week, the third. Remember, we had a 4.68% return, a 4.68% return over a little bit over a month, annualizes to 65.85%. So, Again, emphasis on the fact that we haven't relied on the bull market. In fact, we've made our money in spite of the bull market. And if we keep this type of performance up, yes, we may be underperforming in month one of 2023 when the S&P 500 and NASDAQ have kind of had historic monthly returns. But in the long run, if we you know run our own race, stick to the script and keep this kind of momentum up, this is the number that could be waiting for us on the other side. Is this me telling you that we're going to get 4.68% every single month for the rest of our lives? Absolutely not. But it's more so to contextualize the fact that you may say, oh, you know, it sucks that we're trailing. But look, individually, 4.68% in a month is great. Uh, you know, being upset with that is, you know, comes down to be a little bit of greed. And that's where you start to get yourself in a little bit of trouble. So with that little talk about our performance against the S&P 500 and NASDAQ kind of contextualizing some of that, analyzing how we've done so far, let's talk a little bit about last week because a lot happened. You know, we like to talk a lot about the losing trades because those are the trades that need work. Those are the trades we have to worry about. Those are the trades we have to come up with plans for. Uh, you know, so much so that can sometimes, you know, consume you. But there are so many trades during the week that went our way that we didn't really have to think twice about. You take a look at when. Uh, you take a look at the first carnival. Uh, we'll call that one a loser. Hold on. Uh, Lyft went our way. Uh, Intel, we got out for a profit. COF, we got out for a profit. Uh, IBM, profit. XSP, Lucid. Some of these things we didn't even have to think twice about. You know, some of these trades that equals like a thousandish dollars of profit. However, you know, those get chipped away a little bit by the losers. Uh, the first of which, which didn't end up being a loser thanks to our strategy, is going to be CCL. Uh, we started with 11.5 strike calls and let's pull the ccl chart up to kind of walk through the process of what happened with that trade during the last week talk about how we managed it and went from having a trade that was a loser into a trade uh, that took home a profit of 100 dollars for us despite the fact that the trade moved against us so again heading into last week uh, if we back the chart up a little bit more friday january 27th uh, you know ccl closed at about 11 ish a share so what did we say for the following week? Okay, we'll sell an 11.5 strike call. That gives us a decent cushion up to 11.67. But of course, as so often happens in the market, you could have this great plan, something moves against you, yada, 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 uh, and you have to manage it, right? So if we remove this drawing right here, our initial break even price was gonna be that 11.5 strike that we sold, plus that 17 cents of premium. And you know, after a couple days in the market, Carnival Cruise Line was still below 11 a share. So we said, you know what? Three to four more days in the market is a long time in the market. And that is something I cannot impart upon you guys enough. It is a ton of time in the market. A lot of things can change in a day, in an hour even. The fact that you have three, four days left, uh, you know, that's almost a lifetime in the span of a week. So what we do is we took profit, right? We were able to take about 66-ish percent of total max profit, bag 120 bucks, never think about it again. Uh, then we get to Wednesday. And then we get to Thursday and this thing starts running back up a little bit. And I believe we re-entered at the end of Wednesday, right? It bottomed out at about 1064. Then we had the FOMC on Wednesday, sold off a bit. Then Jerome Powell started talking, the market ripped back up and, you know, the rest is kind of history. But by the end of that day, we had this position where, you know, we previously took profit on it. We were happy to play Carnival Cruise Line back down from that 1150 level. And it was pushing back up towards that 1150 level. So we said, hey. We got out of this thing for five cents before. Let's get back in for 12. It's not quite the 17 that we had initially, but it's still a decent amount of profit now for what effectively is like a two day period. Since that would be end of day Wednesday, we would have only had Thursday and Friday beyond that. So that's exactly what we did. And the way to think about that conceptually is we've already locked in 12 cents of profit. 
uh, we're getting another 12 cents of profit. So it's about 24 cents of premium that we've received, meaning our break even price is like 11.74 ish. And as you can see, based on where this line is, we entered here. It did not take long for a Carnival Cruise Line to pop right back above that on Thursday morning. So what do we do when things move against us, right? We always want to start with what we consider to be kind of a half-sized position. That way, if something's moving rapidly against us, we can manage by doubling down. And while in a sense, you know, doubling down, so to speak, is risky, uh, starting with the half-sized position and going to a full-sized position makes that double down far less risky, right? You get back to the position size that you would have had originally anyways, uh, and in theory, you're getting even more premium. So that's exactly what happened, right? We doubled down with this 12 strike call for 17 cents. So what does this do, right? We had 10, we had 10 contracts, we had 10 more. So we know that every single cent of premium that we're getting here on the 12 strike call is gonna be a cent for cent increase in our break even price, right? This is a bearish trade. We want the stock to go down, so we want our break even price to be higher and higher and higher. So we go from what, 1074, we add 17 to that, uh, that's going to be 1091, which takes this red line from here up to here. And now this isn't some groundbreaking increase in your break-even price, uh, but on such a short-term basis, like two or three days in the market, you know, that's a decent amount of cash. Or a decent amount, I don't know, how do I quantify that unit? I don't know, it's a decent gap, you know, it's a decent increase in your break-even price right there. Uh, getting up to that 11.91 number. And it, it stayed a little bit elevated until the end of day Thursday, right? It was at 12.26 and we were in a situation where we were gonna be losing a bit of money. And of course we could roll that thing into next week and be just fine. But you know, as is so often the case when these things run up like this, eventually they have to cool off a little bit, which is why we wait for the run-ups. You know, we start to play it down. If it keeps running up, you know, we scale in further. And at that point that it's run up twice on us, the way RSI is working, if we go to the 180 day here, you know, you're going to see it peaked at about 80 uh, at, at some point on February the 2nd, around 9 in the morning. And then from there, fell right back down. And that's why we're such big fans of RSI. On a longer term basis, the one year did get above 70, which is a pretty decent bearish thesis that we've seen play out recently. Uh, and of course, by the end of Friday, it did fall back down to about 1180 at close. And while we weren't able to get max profit on this initial position, you know, let's remember this double down that we had, right? These 12 strike calls that we added, you know, they bagged us $170 of profit. Uh, the original trade that we had with the 11.5 strike calls that we, you know, strategically took profit on early in the week because anything could happen and anything did happen. Those bagged us $120. So we have $290 of profit, uh, you know, compared to the $190 loser. So we, we bag $100 of profit on a net basis, even though we started this trade with CCL at what, like 1080 to start the week and it finished a full dollar higher, right? So we had a bearish position on a stock that finished a dollar higher, which when a stock's trading for like 1050, that means that stock basically went up 10% last week, yet we still took home money. Which is like as simple of a way as I can explain why we do what we do, right? We don't have to be right. You know, it's, it makes it a lot easier when we are right and we hit max profit without having to worry about this. And there were several trades where that did happen last week, but when it does move against us, you know, What's your plan B? What's your plan C beyond that? How are you going to mitigate any potential losses as a stock like that moves against you? And that's our general strategy right there. It's very similar to the wheel, but when we're playing things bearishly instead of selling cash secured puts, we, we hit the covered call side and we play things back down. Loving the idea of the market getting overextended, then pulling back down. Uh, one trade where that didn't go as well, right? I mean, transparency, we're not going to win every single trade. We win a lot with what we do, but they're absolutely going to be losers. Anyone who tells you that they have not lost on a trade in the market uh, is either brand new to the market, and they will eventually, or they are lying to your face. So let's talk about probably the worst trade of the week for us, and that's going to be a firm. We lost $1,700 on a firm, right? One of those things where if you look back and you're like, oh, well, if this didn't happen, we would have made like 1500 bucks, you know? But, you know, if, big if, but losses are part of the game, so let's talk about it. Uh, good question from Petty Bourgeois saying, what would have been the problem with taking assignment of the call? And I'm assuming that's referring to this 11.5 strike call that we locked $190 in for. And the answer to that is we actually rolled this into next week, right? We're continuing the position. So instead of taking assignment of short shares, what we want to do, similarly to when we have cash secured puts, right? We want to roll down and out for a credit. When we're selling calls like this, we want to roll up and out for a credit. What does that do? It gives us a credit, meaning we're going to get more overall profit on the trade. 
you know, the trade-off being that we have to wait another week. Uh, but two, it raises our break-even price. Yeah, exactly. So we, we have rolled it, and it's going to be down here. You'll see when we talk about the next week where we could bag another couple hundred bucks off of it. So that is what we're looking at. And yes, we lost, we left maybe 310 bucks on the table if it gets back down below 11.5. But what we've done is we've rolled into a credit spread for 200 bucks, and it's at a higher level, that 12 level, which is great, right? We've moved the profit tar target higher. We're gonna try to bag some more cash, and let's just keep the thing rolling. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Back to a firm, right? Biggest loser on the week. We lost 1,700 bucks on it. It sucks. It's never fun losing money. I don't necessarily think we did anything that incorrect here, as, as strange as that is to say. I think one big takeaway with trades when something goes wrong is, you know, what exactly did we do incorrectly? Because a lot of the times you can make a smart trade, good thesis, and it loses money. Doesn't mean it was a bad trade, doesn't mean it was stupid. Now, conversely, you can make a very dumb trade that works out, doesn't mean it was a, like a smart trade. Uh, but this is one, I think generally we, we did what we were supposed to do. Now, WBD and Affirm are kind of the two trades that have blown up on us this year. Uh, WBD was a couple weeks ago when we lost like a thousand bucks on it. And the one rule that we've set for ourselves to put in place to prevent larger losses like this is anytime we get to a loss of a thousand bucks, we just want to cut the position. We did that effectively on WBD where we lost 1,050. Not so effectively on a firm where we lost about 1700 bucks. And the reason that happened is because there was a little bit of an overnight move. Let's talk about this trade, what it was and how it started. So it started as a credit spread, right? A 16, 17 call credit spread. That means we sell 16 strike calls. We buy 17 strike calls behind it. The net credit is 21 cents. So anything below 1620 on a firm, we're going to make money. Uh, the issue with that, of course, is if you look at a firm on a five-day basis, this thing went from 1483 on Tuesday morning to 22.75 at the peak. It basically went up 50% in three days. That's a massive move. I mean, there's there's no two ways about that. What I will say is like, in the scheme of things, if we really think about what happened objectively last week, we had a stock that we were short on. We were bearish on it. It ran up 50%. And it did, we didn't blow up, right? You know, it sucks to lose 1700 bucks objectively. That's never fun. Uh, but I think we mitigated, it, it could have been a lot worse, right? If something moves 50% against you, it could be a lot worse. So what happened was we were willing to stick with it. We were willing to stick with it. And what we do sometimes when things run against us so heavily, if we go to the one-year chart, it got so, so, so overbought on a one-year basis, right? A firm is something that has already kind of doubled once before in the past calendar year, and the RSI only got up to like 72. Uh, at one point last week, it got up to 76 or 77, which is just red hot. It's going to come back down. The only question is how high is it going to go first, and when is it going to actually come down? Of course, we know the answer to neither of those, which is the fun of trading in the market. Uh, but what we did was we uncovered these things, right? You'll, you'll notice a trade like CCL where we had these 11.5 strike calls, which are technically naked, but sized in such a way I think they're less risky. Uh, firm, we knew it could be a little bit of a high flyer, so we opened a call credit spread to limit our risk. Now, when it did start to push against us, what I said was, hey, there's two parts to this call credit spread, right? We, of course, have the 16 strike call, but there's also the 17 strike call that we bought behind it. Yes, we're going to be losing some cash on the 16 strike call, but that second leg that we used to hedge, that hedge is there for a reason. That hedge is making some money. Uh, and on Wednesday afternoon, we took half of the hedge off, right? Something that we bought for 27 cents went up to 90 cents, meaning we could have bagged $315 of profit, or we did. And that was on Wednesday afternoon when this thing was trading like 18 bucks a share. So at this point, these were worth only like two-ish. It looked a lot better. And then Thursday morning, it ran even higher. We said, look, if this thing keeps going, let's just go fully naked. And I think we, we kind of did it in a smart-ish way. You never want to just cut all 10 of them and just say, we're good, this is going to be the top, it's coming back down. The way that I viewed it was, let's do five at a time, let's leave the other half covered, and then if it keeps moving against us, then we'll remove that other half. And you'll see the benefit of doing that right here, right? The first half that we took profit on, we only made 315 bucks of profit, but when a firm kept flying back upwards, we were able to make 1,000 on the second leg. So that's $1,300 in profit from those hedges that we bought. But of course, the issue beyond that is on Thursday morning, we were set up with 
10 naked affirmed 16 strike calls. And from that position, when you have naked calls, it is risky, but intraday, you're able to manage these things. The way that we wanted to manage this was basically say, look, we know that we have 16 strike calls. This thing's running red hot. We want it to fall back down. We think it's going to fall back down. I know it'll fall back down at some point. Of course, we just don't know how high it'll get and we don't know when. So what we say is we draw a line in the sand. Yes, I think there's an advantage to taking profit on these because look, if we took profit on these two and made 1300 off of that and then 480, we get to a position where, you know, even if it runs this high, if it fell back down to 16 by Friday, we would have made like two grand on the position. So a little bit higher risk, but also some some much higher upside with that approach. But what we have to do to protect ourselves is say, hey, if it gets to X price level, we're just closing the position. Uh, and that's what we did. We said, look, if it gets near 1950 on Thursday morning, we're going to have to get out. And 1950 was here. It opened with a huge red candle. It fell back for a second, so I waited it out a hair. Uh, but when it started going back up from there, look, this is how you protect yourself from blowing up. It sucks to take a $1,700 loss, objectively. But in the scheme of things, our portfolio is big enough. We have enough diversity where if we take a $1,700 loss, we still almost broke even on the week. Had we kept holding past 19.5, there would have been a time on Thursday morning where we would have lost $3,000 more. That is where you start to run into some issues, right? We can handle $1,700 loss, but if that turned into like a $4,700 loss, then you have a problem where one trade is just dominating the week and completely pulls you back. Because look, we're in our profitable weeks, we're making like you know, the first three weeks of the year, that was an average of 2,700 bucks. So if we have one trade that loses us 4,000, that's not good. We're going to have losing trades, but it is so, so, so important to limit the magnitude of those losing trades uh, to a level that we could reasonably make back. Uh, and that's what happened here. And of course, the whole bittersweet thing here is that yes, a firm did top out and pull back. And if we look at it on a five day chart, it got back down to 1817 meaning that these would have been worth like $1,400 more. We would have made the thousand-ish bucks if we held a firm. However, we would have had to endure the near heart attack of this spike on Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, and that's just how it is. Sometimes the trade moves so far against you, you just can't tolerate further risk, and you have to follow your rules and just get out of the trade. Yes, you might regret it if it falls back down. It's like, oh, we would have made a little bit more, a little bit more money, but look, there's no guarantee that it was going to drop from here. If this thing ran up to like 25 and we had lost $6,000, that is a legitimate regret. Me saying, oh, we would have made a thousand more because it went our way just after we exited. You know, that's a, okay, whatever. It sucks. But the big regret that we don't want to have is that further move upwards that just crushes us on a one week basis. Uh, so yes, it sucks to lose money on the trade. I probably sound like a broken record on this point, but you have to make these tough kinds of decisions for the survival of your account, the conservation of your capital, and just keep the ball rolling, right? We've pointed out a few trades that blew up in our face, and we still basically broke even. So we kicked the cannon next week. We've got ourselves set up to make three grand. We'll talk about that in a second, but let's go talk about one more trade for this past week. Uh, very similar to a firm, but it worked. So you'll look at Peloton down here. And Peloton did something very, very similar to a firm where on a five day basis, we had this big spike upwards. But guess what? With Peloton, we actually made money. So if you sum up all of these Peloton trades right here, we made $145. This is basically the affirm idea, but it got executed properly. Not so much executed properly, but like we got the move we were looking for, essentially. So we started with a, what was it? 15.5, 16.5 strike call credit spread, meaning if it finished below 15.5, we'd be good to go. Uh, Peloton had earnings. They were okay, not spectacular. It shot back up. We said, you know what? Let's just play it down below this 15.5 level, which seems decent, right? If we remove this, remove this, you know, looking at this chart right here, that seems like a decent level to play it down below, right? Of course, we know what happens. If we scroll forward, it you know, cruises above that and then really shoots higher on Thursday and gets up near 18 a share. But that was the general idea off the bat. So we did the same thing that we did with the firm, right? Yes, the call credit spread got in a little bit of trouble with those 15.5 strike calls. But remember, the 16.5 that we hedged with, those are looking just fine. So we took profit on those. We took a profit of 
$275 in total. We took five off the bat initially, it ran a little higher, we took five more off the bat. So we bagged 300 ish bucks of profit. That goes against this $600 -ish dollar, uh, loss on the initial trade. And what we did at the end of the day, or, or excuse me, beginning to middle of the day on Friday, was we rolled these 15.5 strike calls up to 16.5. So why did we do this? If we took a look at Friday, this is basically what we were looking at. Uh, it was great when it opened at 1621. I was perfectly happy to sit back and hope that our 15.5 strike calls that we sold would expire worthless and it'd fall back down to the 15.5 level. But again, after this big green candle, we were in a little bit of a position of risk. And we had these 15.5 strike calls when Peloton was trading at 16.5, uh, where they didn't really have any extrinsic value left on them, meaning we effectively just had short shares. We didn't get any protection from the option premium. And when we have a volatile stock that we're selling options on, we always want to be in a position where we're benefiting from the premium that we sell. So what we did was we said, okay, let's just roll up to the 16.5 because we know when the stock's trading at 16.5, every single cent of this is extrinsic value. Meaning if the stock stays exactly where it is, we're going to make every single penny back on that trade. So it gives us like a 30-ish cent cushion as opposed to the zero cent cushion that we had. The only way that this would have been a bad idea in hindsight is if the stock did fall all the way back down to 15.5. If it fell below 16.2, uh, we would have you know, had less profit than we would have before. But conversely, if it kept running, which it did, and again, that's that risk that we want to protect ourselves against. If it keeps running like this to a position where we would be kind of cooked, we need to be protected against that. And that's exactly what this did. It gave us 31 cents more of protection. And as it continued to fly, we scaled in a little bit. But what did we scale in with? We scaled in with another call credit spread. It's a little bit safer, right, when it was trading at the 17.5-ish range. All the indicators, RSI was red, red hot, right? It was about 80 at one point on Friday, which we said, you know, enough is enough at some point. Uh, we added that for $190 of profit. We took profit on both of our hedges, and then we made money on that roll up to 165 so all of that is $745 of profit to combat the initial $600 loss. And again, in plain English, right? We look at this on a five-day basis. We had a three-day trade. We started it here with a firm at like 14, or excuse me, with Peloton at like 14.80. A stock that we were short on went from 14.80 on us up to almost 18 a share. And in fact, it, it didn't even get back down to where it started or even close. It, it closed the week at 16.20. That's like a 15% increase in three days. So a stock that we were bearish on and tried to play down went up 15% in three days. Yet thanks to this approach and this strategy, we made money on it. And it's one of those situations where we could have made a lot more money on it if we got the actual move we were looking for, but that's all right. You know, limit the losses. And if you could pull a profit out of a trade that's kind of a loser like that, that is as big of a win as you could hope to reasonably ask for. So. That's really what I wanted to talk about. CCL management there, you know, management with the firm where one went against us and we just had to hit that stop loss, had to get out of the trade. It sucks to lose a big number. But then a very similar setup where it did kind of go back in our direction, worked out for us, and we were able to get back near break even on the week. So again, big picture, we lost 265 bucks and we were basically entirely bearish with our positions. So if we were entirely bearish, the market went up like, 1.64% the S&P 500 and like over 3% on NASDAQ and we're breaking even, that's a phenomenal place to be in. At some point, this market is going to turn around, which potentially brings us to next week. Let's talk about how we are going to make money for next week, right? Uh, if the market does go back down, or let's just talk a little bit about our base profit here. If the market is dead flat, if every single stock for each position that we are holding doesn't move a single inch, this is what we're going to take home. It's going to be a profit of $2,948, enough to make our little, you know, treading water exercise over the last couple of weeks where we lost 265 uh, and then made 116 for a small step back. Uh, that's going to look like nothing if we come in here with a $3,000 profit next week. Uh, if we look at that, that gets us right back into the winner's circle, keeps us moving very nicely. I think this is incorrect. It's adding up too many. Is this incorrect? No, it is correct. Okay, cool. That's correct. So we made 8.1K in January. We're trying to get off to a good start in February with 3,000 bucks. But again, we're running our own race here a little bit. We're playing things bearish. We hope that the market comes back. We compare ourselves to the S&P 500. We compare ourselves to NASDAQ. We hope that these fall down and we step up this week. 
And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, right? We know that we are sized appropriately to where we could use some of these defensive techniques that we talked about that we used last week, or even better if the market moves in our direction, meaning it goes down, uh, things will be very, very nice, right? Presumably Peloton will go back down below 16. You know, Airbnb likely will be below 118, XRT goes down. And then we're looking at something a little bit above 3,000 bucks. So that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, but conversely, if it moves against us, right, we've got all these cushions. Peloton can go up 3.69, CCL 3.39. You know, you could read these numbers here. These are the moves that we would have to have against us just to start to lose money uh, on these positions. So happy with how we are set up there for next week. But let's talk about some of these trades. Peloton is a continuation of what we did last week. I did get the impression that we flew a little bit too close to the sun uh, with what we did, but premium is still great there. Uh, learning our lesson a little bit, right? We're not going to start with 10. We're just starting with five right here, giving ourselves the ability to scale in. Uh, I was a little bit conflicted here, maybe thinking about going with the call credit spread uh, just for that additional protection. Uh, but Peloton's earnings are behind them. There aren't really any similar companies that might be having earnings during the same time frame. So I'm actually okay going naked here. And again, same idea as before. If it shoots up against us and goes crazy, uh, we'll just get out. We're going to set that mental stop loss. If this gets near the neighborhood of like a thousand dollar loss, we're out of there. Uh, we just accept we're wrong. Carnival Cruise Line, this is one where I just mentioned with Peloton, there isn't really anything going on uh, from an earnings perspective, but with CCL there is. While CCL themselves are not presenting earnings next week, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, if I don't know if that's their official name, ticker RCL, uh, is going to be reporting earnings. So we could definitely see a lot more volatility there, right? If we take a look at the option chain on CCL, it would have been really easy to just, you know, take those 11.5 calls that we had last week, flip them over to like 12s for next week and bag the full 30-ish cents of premium because uh, that would have given us like a 300, 310-ish dollar profit. However, let's look on the back leg of this. We know that there's a potentially volatile event coming up with Carnival Cruise Line or with RCL earnings. So to prevent some huge run-up, because we know that it is capable of that, just be smart, buy the hedge behind it, turn it into a call credit spread, pay 100 bucks to protect yourselves, right? Because look, the most that we could lose on this right now is it could be worth $1, meaning we lose 800 bucks. Now, if Carnival Cruise Lines, for whatever reason, goes insane and went up to like 15 and we had sold these things for 31 uh, these would be worth three. We'd be looking at a much larger loss. So at least off the bat, while we go into that earnings event, again, I don't think it's going to happen. It's not likely it's going to happen. That's why these options are so cheap to buy behind it. But while they are cheap, just help yourself sleep a little bit better at night. What is $100 less of profit in order to protect yourself from the difference between what could be like a $1,000 loss versus like a $2,000 loss, right? Because we love talking about these small gains, but if you really think about it, in a sense, a smaller loss is just as good as a gain sometimes, right? Saving, you know, saving like an $800 loss as compared to like a $2,000 loss is almost as good as a $1,200 gain. I mean, it is as good as a $1,200 gain on a different position. Uh, so all about that capital conservation, protecting ourselves in case things do continue to move against us and staying agile with our positions. Spotify, this is one that we have been fighting on the way up for multiple, multiple weeks here. And if we go back over the history of what we've done with Spotify, uh, it's kind of gotten us a little bit, I think. I think we're down a little bit on it so far year to date. Uh, so you'll first see Spotify come onto our profit tracker the week of January 15th when we started playing it down from 94. 94. What is Spotify currently at? It closed at 121.17 on, uh, on Friday. So we started playing something down from 94. We sat out earnings, which worked out very, very well for us. But basically, you go to a 20-day chart. We started playing it down from this level back around this time frame. Why is that? We go to the one-year chart. RSI is red hot, right? This is an 83.86 RSI. If there were another volatile event like earnings coming up, I would say, you know, of course, it could keep pushing higher. But we've got earnings behind it. I mean, they were decent, but not like groundbreaking. Uh, we're running into form. Where's my mouse? There we go. Former established resistance up here at like the 124 125 ish level so i think this is when we start to play it a little bit more aggressively if we sum up all of our trades of spotify so far right remember we played it down from here ish and it has continued to explode upwards but we take that where's our other spotify trades we lost a couple hundred more on it that week dot 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 we sat it out 
two weeks ago, or we sat out last week. Uh, no, we got back in. There it is. There it is. We lost another 100 bucks. So we're down like 500 bucks on Spotify. So this week, I want to be a little bit more aggressive with the strike. Typically, we would sell something like a, uh, if we go all the way down here, we typically would sell something like a 126 or a 127 and just try to bag a dollar or two of profit. But I love the idea of coming down here to like the 122 where we could bite off a little bit more in premium, right? Uh, we were able to get 327 of premium on that. So instead of only getting back like 100 or so dollars, we'd get back 327. And while that's not gonna get us back to break even on Spotify, you know, even if it does, if it does fall back down here below 122, we'll be in a position where Spotify has run up a ton against us. And yet we've only lost 172 bucks, which furthers that conversation about just limiting your losses, which is so, so, so important with uh, how this strategy works. And again, we, we talk about that only because it's a loser and those are the ones that need to be managed like that. There are so many other trades that just go our way and we don't have to think twice about them. Win is a great example of that. This one, actually, I, I may take that back because it hasn't exactly moved our way. It's just kind of hasn't moved against us as severely, if that makes sense. So if we can go back a few weeks and take a look at when we started playing win, I mean, we've been sticking with this one almost the entire year so far, right? We started playing this one the week of January 8th at 97, at 97. So this is another one where we started playing this thing down at 97 and it's continued to move against us. We haven't really seen that big relief candle for win coming back down, but despite that fact, we add up our profit and loss on win so far, right? We roll up to 99 the next week. Uh, we take advantage of the premium. We roll up to 100 the week after that. Uh, we take advantage of the premium again, and we roll up to 103. And cumulatively, so far, we've made 225 bucks off of win. Next week, we're up to a 104 strike for $198 of potential profit. So even though we started playing win at 97 and it's run up, so long as win finishes below 104, which is going from here all the way up here, that's a pretty significant jump. But so long as it finishes below this number right here, we're gonna have made 423 bucks on win so far, despite the fact that it's been moving against us. And again, this kind of furthers the idea of all these bearish trades that we've been pushing along week after week after week as things have moved further and further and further against us. These are very manageable thanks to the premium that they offer. And we love the bearish thesis on these because of, look at the one year chart, it got overbought. Now it has cooled off a little bit. It has cooled off a little bit, which is why I didn't get as aggressive as Spotify. And I, I stayed out of the money uh, on win with the 104. But once this thing gets back down to 60 or below, that is when we cut ties with this one, uh, unless there's another you know, reason that gives us conviction to play that one further. But for now, we've got that set up at 104. It'll bag 198 bucks. And all of a sudden for next week, you start to see how these smaller trades are adding up bit by bit by bit, right? All of a sudden between those first four trades that we talked about, that's $1,000 of potential profit right there. Uh, and that's really only 27% of our account from a sizing perspective. Uh, Intel, we opened this one on Friday and we could talk about this and Meta as well. Uh, but Intel, we opened a 30.5 strike call. I, I still do like the idea of playing this down. Uh, one maybe area, you could call it, of stock that I think is great for bearish entry right now are these companies where you see this big gap down, right? And that's those candles are way too big to meaningfully look at this. You see these massive candles down. And why did those occur? Because they had poor earnings. But all of a sudden, you see them almost instantly fill that gap over the next week or so just because of how hot the market has been. And I think this category of stock that, you know, gapped down from bad earnings and has run back up to fill the gap, those should provide some decent bearish entries as we move forward here. So that was the idea with Intel. We sold 30.5 strike calls for 76 cents. But by the end of the day on Friday, they were trading for 40 cents a piece. And if you look at them, I think they're even lower now. They're at like 36 cents. So it kept moving in our favor. But the idea is simple, right? Uh, one good example of this last week was COF. If a trade has moved in your direction and it's, you know, Monday or Tuesday and you could take a significant meaning like 60, 70 ish percent of total profit, you do it right. Because this 119 strike call that we sold on COF, we got out for 15 cents on like Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning or something like that. Let me find the COF chart. Yeah, we got out down here on Wednesday morning. We said, okay, you know, easy. Yes, our strike is all the way up here at 119. It'd be so hard for it to get back to 119, but guess what? 
the only guarantee you have in the market is what these things are trading for right in front of you as we speak. And for me, that was basically sacrificing 15 more dollars of premium to lock in a $151 gain. And lo and behold, we saw the back end of that chart when I brought it up a second ago. While it seemed very improbable that Capital One would go from 112 back up to the 119 strike that we sold, it did in less than 24 hours and actually ran up to a point where this would have been about a 300-ish dollar loss for us. So again, small moves like that, even though it may not seem significant because, oh, I'm leaving $15 on the table, I'm never gonna think about this trade again. Had we not done that, that's a $400, $500 -ish swing in our account. That is significant. So taking profits, especially in a market this volatile, is so, so, so important. And that's exactly what the idea was with Intel. Now, Intel was a little bit closer to 50 cents or 50% of max profit, but we talk about taking tr like profits early on a Monday or a Tuesday. If you open a trade on Friday for the next week and by the end of the day on Friday, you're able to get out of that trade for almost 50% max profit, to me, that's a no-brainer. We're, we're bearish on the market. If the market starts running back up and takes Intel with it, we'll get right back in. We'll get right back in for something similar to this credit, except we'll have, we'll have 180 bucks in our back pocket that we could take into that trade as well. Uh, same exact idea with Meta, right? We sold a 205 strike call. We go to Meta, oops, M-E-T-A. On Friday, it fell back off that 195-ish level. And by the end of the day, it was worth less than a dollar. So to me, no brainer. That's over 50% of your max profit right there. Let's lock in 110 and let's never think about it again. Yes, we did leave about $130 on the table. But what this did accomplish uh, was we lock in 290. And if you could do that basically before the week even starts, that's a fantastic step. You know, you're getting off on the right step, on the right foot. Is that the saying? I don't know. We're about an hour in. My brain's starting to leave me a little bit. Uh, but if we keep moving down the list, let's talk some more about some open trades. Airbnb, 118 strike call. We sold this for 3.2. This is a continuation of a trade last week where we entered with the 117 strike call. Yes, we lost about 36 bucks on that first leg, but what do we do? When something moves against us, we roll up, we roll out, and we roll for a credit when it's a call. Uh, and we did that here, right? We rolled up, meaning we rolled from 117 to 118. Uh, we rolled out, meaning we rolled from the February 3rd expiry to the February 10th expiry. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we rolled for a credit, meaning we closed the 117 strike for 171. And we opened the new one for 3.2, meaning we sold the new one for about $1.50 more uh, than the old one. And I think if I pop over to the Discord really quickly, I like wrote out what our new breakeven price is on this trade. Get some dead air here, bear with me. Perfect. So what this looks like now, Airbnb, the trade right here. We closed it for 171. We sold the new one for 320. Since we roll up, we roll out, we get a credit. That increases our break even price in multiple ways. So the first trade that we opened was the 117 strike where we got $1.35. We got a 149 credit on our roll. And then our strike increased by $1 from 117 to 118. All of those things work together to take our break even price up to $120.84, which is a pretty decent increase in the break even price on a week over week basis. So if we go A, B, and B, uh, we basically took our break even price from you know 117, 118-ish, uh, and it's now sitting at 120.84. So that's the idea week after week. You just keep moving the target up and up and up. And since we rolled for a credit, uh, our max profit on the trade is our original max profit now plus that credit that we received. So not only do we raise the break-even price, but we raise the overall amount of money that we're taking in from the trade. What's the catch? We have to wait another week. But I'll, I'm fine to trade time for money uh, any day in this market, and that's really the entire idea uh, behind the strategy that we're running out here. So if we flip back here... What else do we have for the coming week? SQQQ, another idea based off a of bearish trade. Yes, this is a cash secured put, but you know, don't let that fool you. SQQQ is a bearish ETF based off of tech. Why did we choose tech? The answer is because tech is the most overbought thing out there right now, basically. If you take a look at NASDAQ and consider that, right? If we go to SQQQ, uh, we go to the one year chart here. We've got RSI at 32.15. Not there, there was not a single point in the past year, and there were a couple large run-ups over the past year. There was not a single point in the last year on SQQQ 
where it got into the blue from an RSI perspective. And what do we mean when we say in the blue, quote unquote? What we mean is below 30. In fact, the lowest that we really see is kind of, you know, 31-ish. Uh, and that was back in mid-August. And what happened in mid-August? I don't know. Let's look at what happened in mid-August. I know what happened. We peaked and then ran way down. So a lot of indicators here, you know, looking at RSI on the S&P 500, looking at RSI uh, on SQQQ, even something like UVXY, volatility product. When these things get beaten down like this, again, last time it was really hammering these lows, that's that mid-August point again. And what happened from mid-August forward? A huge decrease in the market. So these are also some other macro trends that we want to pay attention to uh, when we think about the strategy that we're running and the way that we position ourselves each and every week. Right now, that positioning is bearish. Uh, and this is why. So we have that SQQQ position to further play out that bearish idea. And the, the reason I like this, again, it's another one of those trades where we've started with five contracts. I'm happy to scale into a full size to 10. So our break even price is 32.25. That means that this can drop about 7% and we're still going to make money on the trade as it sits for next week. Uh, and the way that this works and the reason that I like taking the half size position on something like SQQQ is even if it does get down to that 32.25 ish level, which is still very, very low historically, not that, you know, long term support and resistance is really relevant on a leveraged ETF, but we'll be able to add some more and get that even lower, probably in the 31 ish range. And then we could just roll from there and hope for a little bit of a reversal on tech. Uh, but that's that XRT is one that we've got right here. This is an interesting one. It's, it's a retail ETF. And I really, really like this trade. It kind of came out of nowhere. I found it in one of our overbought scanners. Why did I find it? Because RSI went up over 70 and there was decent premium on the options, meaning about 1% uh, kind of around the money right here. So what we did was we said, hey, Let's maybe take something on a little bit more aggressively, right? Let's sell something in the money, uh, which would hopefully offer us a little bit more premium and go from there. So what I did was I sold the 72 strike call on Friday. And you'll notice 72 was a little bit in the money. It was in the money by about two bucks at that point. But again, we get that credit of 250, meaning our break even price is 74.5. So we've got a little bit of an upside cushion there. While if we get down below this red line, we're gonna make 250 bucks on the trade. And the great part about this, I'm perfectly happy to sell naked calls on this because it's a retail ETF. It's not some individual company that's going to squeeze. In fact, on a one year basis, it's traded in a range between 83 and 55, which you know might be something you consider larger, but it's not something like in a firm where on a one year basis, it's gone from like 83 to eight, right? XRT is a much more stable stock. Happy to potentially even take assignment and go short on it. Because look, oh, oh, it's an ETF. It's, it's not going to freak out on you. And so long as this premium exists like it does, we could keep knocking that break even price up a buck each week without much of an issue. Uh, so a little bit safer one there that we're going to rely and lean a little bit more heavily on RSI with because look, last time it got into the red, what happened? Shot back down from 74 to 61. So there we go. Uh, we've got Petty Bourgeois saying, instead of trading naked, why not buy a long call way out of the money to reduce risk and lower the buying power requirement? Great question. Uh, first thing I would say is uh, when you have a margin account, a lot of the time the buying power requirement isn't that large. So that's typically why I don't give that much of a consideration. But when you are trading with the riskier stock, I think that's a very, very smart move. Like you look at CCL, we turn that into a call credit spread. And uh, that is going to protect us. We look at something like Peloton and Affirm that we had last week. We used call credit spreads. Uh, however, when we look at something like a something like a win, right, that we already talked about. Yes, this is a little bit wider of a range here. But if we look on the three-year chart, you know, this isn't a stock that's going to have some huge short squeeze. Uh, any any moves upwards have kind of been you know steadier grinds upwards. So it's a little safer. There's not some huge short interest where the stock is hard to borrow or something like that. Uh, so those are things that we keep an eye on. But if that is a situation we run into where you know you see a really large move, like if we go to the WBD chart and we see something like this, that's a trade that we're going to want to approach with a call credit spread because these, I don't think they're. It doesn't show it on the weekends for whatever like borrowing. 
Uh, but if you have something like AMC or GameStop where there's heavy short interest and you know the three-year chart looks insane like this or something like that, absolutely buy that call. Absolutely turn that into a call credit spread. Uh, but for some of these you know, more stable stocks that might not offer as much premium as the volatile ones, uh, I don't think it's truly necessary so long as you're paying attention to market risk. Like with CCL, we know that RCL is reporting earnings. You know, If you have a stock where there's a very similar company reporting earnings, probably best to protect yourself. Uh, but for these, I think they're generally manageable otherwise. So that's the idea there, especially with something like XRT, which is what we were talking about during that message. Uh, that really isn't liable to scream against these. So I don't even think there's you know too much of a need to buy the other side of that. Uh, Ford is a good one here that I'm kind of a fan of. They've declared that they're going to start paying a dividend. So what do we do here? We kind of play it both ways. Earnings weren't phenomenal and the stocks run up a little bit. But a 13.5 strike and a 13.5 strike put call creating a strangle, you know, kind of lets us play either side from here, right? So if it keeps going down, our break even on the low side is going to be $12.55. And at that point, we would be assigned shares via those 13 strike puts that we sold, that we sold. So we'd get the shares at 12.55 ish right down here, which like on a one month basis is not a bad place to be at all. That's perfectly fine. I'm happy to take shares there. However, if it screams back upwards, you know, we would then have a short position at 1395, which is all the way up here. And can it get back up there? Absolutely. But based off their earnings report, I, I'm fine to play Ford back down from that level. Ford's a little safer of a stock. Uh, there are some runs that we've seen historically on it. So we definitely want to keep an eye on that. But look, RSI is pretty neutral here. Uh, here we go. Good question from Jeff. I figured this would come up. Uh, are we not worried about the special dividend for Ford next week that will lower the strike prices by 65 cents? Now, they've declared the special dividend and it is 65 cents. However, I do think the ex div date is not going to be until uh, after next week. So I think the special dividend on Ford is going to be, let's see if we find it. Is there anything in the news wire here? Let me actually look it up online because so i looked into this earlier great question good call out on ford f special dividends where here we go some really fun airtime here as i do research on my other browser so i guess the x div date is february 10th 2023 interesting and it looks like that was announced 619 on february the third which would be friday so what I think is interesting about this is typically it's going to go down by 65 cents, which even if it goes down 65 cents from here, we're fine. Uh, but what I think potentially is interesting, let's look at this here. These options aren't priced as if there's going to be a dividend. The reason I say that is because typically when, you know, Ford pays it, you know, when a company pays a dividend, uh, and it's like 65 cents, for example. It is on the 10th. You're right, Jeff. That I've confirmed that in what I just looked up. What's interesting about this is like, you know, theoretically basic dividend, you pay 60 cents on the X div date, the stock goes down 60 cents. That normally is priced in to these options. So the way that it works, and I think what might be happening here, is that it's shareholders of record at Ah, uh, the strikes get adjusted. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So if the strikes get adjusted, we're just fine. We're just fine because this will get adjusted down and then the call strike that we have will also get adjusted downwards. So there's going to be zero impact to our position. Uh, nothing's really going to happen there. So to quell any potential fears about that, uh, no, I'm not worried about that because if the strikes are adjusted on the special dividend, then we are going to be just fine because the strikes will account for that. So moving along, JWN. Now we have a very, very bearish portfolio. In fact, I think every single position that we've talked about so far is bearish. So what do we want to do? We need to mix in a couple of bullish trades, but how do we find these bullish trades, right? Uh, we, we don't necessarily want to have bullish trades because we are firmly of the belief that the market is gonna go down. It's already down 0.31% right now from a futures perspective, which, you know, <laughs> futures are kind of nothing sometimes. 
Uh, but we need to have a couple just in case the market keeps going up. So we've strategically selected JWN and EA as these bullish positions for the week. So why these two? The first is JWN, which had a massive, massive, massive green candle. And the idea here is that there's this big spike in implied volatility, which is pumping some premium into those options. And we're able to sell 23.5 strike for 48 cents. So the stock right now is at 26.38. We know that our break even price here is gonna be at 23.02. So 23.02 is all the way back down here, which on a five day basis looks kind of crazy because it's only, let's remove this drawing. It's only here and it's definitely in the middle of this candle. Ideally, we would like to sell something at the 21-ish level, but as it levels off, as implied volatility starts to come back down a little bit, uh, the idea is the premium on that's gonna get killed. And if the market drops, the market drops. You know, a, a stock that's run up like this dependent on news and the news that came out was about Ryan Cohen potentially investing in this. Uh, it, it's gonna be far less likely to drop with the market and kind of behave independently of that in a sense. So if the market does crash, you know, I'm a little bit more comfortable that this type of a position is gonna be a little bit safer. And at the end of the day, if we get assigned, we only sold five contracts, we'll get assigned at 23 a share. We look at that on a 180 day basis. Yes, it has been much lower than that before, but it starts to get back down to this low 20 range where I think we could at least have it be manageable. But this is one, an IV reversion type trade, you know, as that volatility kind of peters out and premium hopefully gets sucked out a little bit, one that I would be very, very happy to exit early either tomorrow or on Tuesday for a profit. Uh, next one, EA, 114 strike put. This is one where I think the entry is phenomenal, right? You don't see a lot of stocks that are low on RSI right now, but earnings weren't phenomenal. That's okay. Uh, but this is a little bit steadier of a company, right? We know that this thing is traded between like 110 and 142 over the last calendar year. You know, it's EA. It's not some pre-revenue like crazy growth company that's run up a million percent in the past three years. Even on the three-year basis, right? This 110 level looks phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. So what do we do? We start a bullish position off at 114. We sell it for a dollar premium. We know that our break-even price is 112.97, uh, and we and we chill with that. Yes, it looks weird on the five-day because it drops so hard off of earnings. Typically, I find that earnings are like a three, two to three-ish day continuation. We're past that three-day window. Can it keep going down? Absolutely. Uh, but on a one-year basis, you've got RSI sitting at 25.80, which you'll see when I move the mouse. And that is insanely, insanely low. Even for an earnings driven drop off, like we saw, you know, back in uh, May of 2022 on this one, when it didn't even get down below 30, uh, it, it bounced back up pretty steeply from that. So I'm at least comfortable at potentially initiating a position uh, at the 113 ish range on this one. And again, it's half sized. I'm happy to double down. Let's roll down and out for a credit with one contract while we can. Uh, but Otherwise, this is a bullish position that hopefully if the market keeps moving, we'll at least derive a little bit of profit from this one and JWN. And then of course we have our XSP strangles, which last week, uh, where were they? The 408 strike that we rolled as a continuation of two weeks ago profited. Uh, the new strangle that we had lost 58 bucks. And then we sold a 417 call by itself, which is not part of that strategy. Uh, but this week, look, we, we've got a 408, 418. We know our break even price is going to be between 404, 46, and 421, 54. All that to say, I think we've got a pretty wide range of profit. Why isn't it letting me type? There we go. Our range of profit, if I remove these old drawings, move in on like a five day basis. Uh, again, between 404, 46. And the high side is going to be 421.54. So with this XSP strangle, if it'll let me draw this. If XSP finishes on a five-day basis between these two red lines, this position is going to make money. And hopefully we'll stay between there and we won't even have to worry about managing the position at all. And we could bag 354 bucks of profit if it stays between 408 uh, and 418. But again, these red lines, this is our profit range. And even last week was a pretty volatile week where we saw the market run a bunch. And if you extend these lines to the left on a five day basis, the move that we have captured in this strangle, last week's big move basically stayed within that. So I think we can kind of get another decently large move and, and, and be okay. Uh, but that's something again, we'll continue to monitor. And if it does get outside one of these red lines, we will manage it as we typically do. 
And that trade's been working pretty well for us, right? These XSP strangles, you know, assuming we have max profit here, because that's just how this is getting pulled into the sheet. Uh, will have gotten us up to $1,500 of total P&L, which is an 18.51% return in just the you know one and a half months that we've been running this strategy. And again, there are ways where you don't have to use $8,000 of collateral and you could use 2,000, where it's like a 74% return in a month and a half. But uh, you know, to give a more conservative estimate and do this, you know, in maybe the least clickbaity way possible, uh, this is the way it looks right now, 18.51%. And that is what we've got for the coming week. Not a ton going on in terms of earnings. We could pull that calendar up and look at it really quickly before we sign off for the night. Here it is. I mean, we've got something like Pinterest, but a lot of those stocks that have sympathy trades related to them have kind of already gone, right? The Snapchats, the Metas of the world, PayPal. Lyft could be interesting here with the Affirm 1-2 combo. Uh, we could also, there's Royal Caribbean. We know that CCL might move off of that. Another thing that we might consider, we, we tried a couple of them historically, uh, but this idea of the sympathy straddle that we've been working on. So there's one that I need to add because I know we lost money on one, but I don't think I added it yet. And I think it was Apple. So I need to go back and add that. But in general, these have been working very, very well for us, right? The idea here is you find a stock that's reporting earnings. For example, let's just pull this over here. Uh, you know, Uber is reporting earnings on Wednesday. So what do we know? What what company might move similarly to Uber? The answer is right here. It's Lyft. So on Tuesday afternoon, what you're going to want to do at like 1230 p.m. ish, noon ish, is you're going to buy an at the money straddle. And the idea is as we approach this date of earnings for Uber, Lyft implied volatility is also going to tick upwards. And as Lyft implied volatility ticks upwards, that option premium is premium is going to presumably increase. And then before the end of the day, we get out of the trade. So it's that idea of a sympathy straddle. It's, it's worked decently well. We've kept position sizes very small. As you can see, we only have like $100 of profit. But on a percent basis, the returns are pretty decent, an average of 3.17%. And you may say like 3.17%, like whatever, that's not a ton. But think about this. These trades are from noon to like 3.30 or 4 p.m., that's an average of 3.17% in three or four hours. So, you know, we know that we love 1% per week. If you can get 3% in an, like three or four hour period, that's phenomenal. So we're continuing this in test phase, but I definitely want a lot more data points on this uh, before continuing to move forward and start really, really scaling up the size of these. So we'll potentially try to do something like that uh, on Tuesday. Uh, but with that said, you know, that's what we've got. I think it's been a great year objectively so far. Uh, one word that kind of comes to mind when looking at last week is potentially bittersweet, uh, which is kind of annoying, but it is what it is, right? We've got to run our own race. And if you told me that I'd be upset with like, you know, this, this includes this number. So if you told me that I'd be upset with, you know, a January profit of $8,200, I would probably look at myself and tell myself to shut up. So let's keep doing what we're doing. Keep scaling and be smart about our positions. Look at RSI. Keep an eye on that uh, and just keep pushing forward, right? So that's going to be the game plan. Let's flip over to the full screen as we sign off. For those of you who have stayed with us the whole night, appreciate it. Uh, I know we've always got the thing at the bottom of the screen for the HT giveaway. Uh, we're getting close to 30 live viewers. It's getting up there. I'll have to have like a little widget in the corner or something that shows how many people we've got at a time. Uh, but we're getting close. We've got the, uh, actually, let me grab them. They're right next to me. Hold on. This is what we're giving away right here. And for some reason, OBS is weird, so I don't know if the camera's working. But we've got the HT branded tumblers. Yeti brand too. These aren't off brand, baby. So if we get up to 30 live viewers, one of these is being given away. I eagerly await the day uh, that that is going to occur. And I still don't know if my camera worked. So... It looks like it's back on. So just in case it didn't work, boom, there they are, the HT Tumblr. So if we get to 30 live viewers next week, uh, that'll be that. Uh, but until next time, this has been Hourglass Trader, where as time passes, we make money. Again, really appreciate, cannot express it enough, all of you who keep tuning in week after week and supporting us. Uh, and hopefully we can help you out as well. And it is, you know, there's no limit of people in here who can make money, right? We're not stealing from each other. We're in on the same trades and we could all win together. So hopefully we talk to you guys next time, next week, same time with more money in our accounts than we have right now. 
And uh, let's have a good week. We'll be in the Discord server all week, hourglass-trader.com. The big purple button in the middle is the invitation to join if you want to trade with us and chat in there. Uh, but that's all we got. So thanks for tuning in, which I've probably said like six times at this point, but I'll keep saying it. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you guys again next week.